welcome everybody to this last um, slot for the conversation sessions on the first day of the ABLE annual meeting. It's my pleasure to hand over the microphone now to Australia after we've heard some uh, colleagues from the North American continent uh, talk. Over to Gail Brent, Christopher Allen and uh, David Green from Griffiths University who are going to talk about connecting experiences. And I look forward to having the conversation session with them. If you would like to see the live transcript, you're welcome to turn that on in the bottom of your screen. And we will also share the recording afterwards, as well as any links that the team will make available to us. Over to you guys. Okay, thank you. And nice to see everybody here in um, obviously different time zones and things all over the place. Um, so just to introduce ourselves um, briefly and then we'll, we'll get going on our, um, our conversation. Uh, so my name is Gail and my role in the Griffith Sciences Group is a learning and teaching consultant, but I have a particular focus on employability, which is, um, which is quite unique in our university. We do have other people working in the space but nobody who works in the, in the learning and teaching consultant role embedded within an academic uh, group. So what you might call a faculty, we call a group. Um, so my role really is um, dedicated to helping students develop their employability awareness. And I do that both through extracurricular activity and through embedded activity, which we'll talk about um, throughout the session today. Uh, I suppose I could speak next. I'm Christopher Allen. I'm a learning teaching consultant uh, designer, which basically means I help people with blended learning uh, and working using technology to support their learning and teaching. I'm a former teacher, so it, I, uh, it's always been an interest to, to be working with uh, people to develop their teaching practice. And uh, yes, I'm David Green, and I can pretty much say exactly the same thing Chris just said, uh, but with my name. Uh, yeah, so previous a teacher and now working in the university helping um, helping put together the courses and, and the teaching and learning with, with the different courses. Okay, so when we were putting the abstract um, for our conversation together today, we were thinking about um, the challenges students have with respect to developing their employability awareness and um, taking advantage of opportunities to actually engage in that career development learning. So we know that while it's very important to students and there's been lots of research in that space that um, gives us that evidence that students are aware that this kind of activity is important, they do come to university with the intention to improve their prospects for their career. Um, so we know that that's a focus. But we also know that when they arrive at university, sometimes life just becomes so busy. And while it's still important, it can sometimes become less urgent for them to actually attend to this kind of um, personal and professional development. So at Griffith in the Sciences Group, we've actually developed a range of um, models that we can use to help students um, have that opportunity to actually engage in those kinds of learning activities. So the first model, um, Close that. Um, the, the, the first model we had was the Griffith Sciences Plus program. So that quite literally stands for professional learning for university students. Um, it's a fully extracurricular model. So this is something that students obviously choose to engage with. Um, it runs, it's, the, the activities are scaffolded and aligned to the student life cycle. Um, but we do tend to find that students like to get in and, and, and get their plus um, achievement uh, sorted in one go. So when I originally developed it, it, you know, I planned for it to run across first, second and third year. Um, but that kind of longevity doesn't really work for students. They like to be able to see their progress very quickly when they're actually um, engaging in these kinds of activities. So while the activities are still aligned to the life cycle, um, they do also adapt for students regardless of whether they're in first, second or middle years or final year. Um, the Lego picture there, you know, there was an opportunity here to actually develop a model in this space because we do know that there's been lots of focus on the future of work and the changes in the, in the workplace for students now. It's not going to be a career path anymore. 
um, that they will actually need to have these career management skills to actually be successful in the long term. So that's one of the opportunities we had was to introduce students to that notion um, that, you know, it's not like the Lego world where they get dressed up as the businessman or the firefighter or the police person and, and that's their assigned role. They actually have to be very, very proactive in the space so that they can manage multiple roles, um, manage contract positions and always be looking for what the next opportunity might be while they're still giving 100% to whatever job they're doing at a particular point in time. So that created this opportunity for us um, with PLUS to actually help students realise um, the importance of that career development activity. So how to PLUS, how do we actually do it? Um, students attend workshops. At the moment, they are, are all online. Um, I shifted them all online when obviously um, we were impacted by COVID. And I've kept with the online model because I find it actually works well for students and, and I get good attendance. So I do actually create a virtual workshop room like that. So those are real students who completed PLUS um, in the last trimester. They then proactively reflect on their activity. So this is a really important component in the PLUS program because um, we know that that skill of continuous learning, the ability to adapt and transfer skills into multiple um, contexts within the career is very important. So asking students to um, reflect after every single workshop and to pick out the things that were important for them, um, not only does it develop that that reflective practice and that skill, but it also allows us to um, customise the PLUS program for every student because they are encouraged to identify what's important for them. Um, we then They then unlock rewards as they go. So they get bronze, silver and gold level and they unlock, unlock various rewards at each point. Um, the important points about this model, it is fully extracurricular um, and it is quite scalable and quite individualised. So a couple of slides here. This is just students celebrating their achievement as they progress through PLUS. So this helps demonstrate how important it is to the students um, that they're achieving these um, milestone points at bronze and silver level. And then at gold level, they earn a digital badge in their specific discipline and they also unlock some other career development rewards. Um, you know, I, I, I developed the PLUS program about seven years ago. It, you know, I put a lot of energy into it. It's really um, very rewarding for me that I do get positive feedback from students all the time. Um, but again, it's an important point because this is voluntary. It's fully co-curricular. Students do not have to do this. And yet we do have a really diverse range of students engaging in this program and really wanting to succeed in PLUS. We're going to talk more about the way we use learning designs a little bit later, but I wanted to show you how comprehensive the program actually is. Um, so this gives you a little bit of an idea. At bronze level, the students do three workshops and their reflections. Um, they get feedback from me after every reflection. They submit their resume and their LinkedIn profile and then unlock um, some rewards at that level. They're able then to progress to silver where they do another four workshops with the reflections. Um, they submit a cover letter and at this point they do get a recommendation on their LinkedIn profile. And then they progress into their gold, three more workshops um, and the attendance is actually very strong at those workshops. And then they create a portfolio of their experiences, which is the, you know, um, the important outcome because it's obviously not only the product that outward facing showcase of their work and their experiences and their skills and abilities, but it's also the process of um, reflecting on all of their experiences, not just their curricular work, um, but their broader life experiences and pulling it together into a comprehensive narrative about what it is they can do and what they offer in the workplace. So you can see it's quite comprehensive. So the fact that it is fully extracurricular and students are engaging with it in the way they are is actually um, you know, quite notable, we think. So, Chris, did we want to go to the Padlet at this point and get some ideas? So if people have um, similar programs, extracurricular programs, what have been the opportunities for you there or what have been the challenges or why might you go in this direction or why might you choose not to go with an extracurricular model? Yeah, so we have a, a Padlet that's available, which we get, people can easily add stuff to if they wish, but they're also welcome just to ask a question here. Uh, and so if people want to uh, just ask the question, we can uh, have a conversation about uh, other ideas of people, uh, how they've uh, set up employability in their uh, universities or other environments. 
Um, I, I have a quick question. In, as I know, especially in the New Zealand and also Australian context, work integrated learning is becoming more and more important. And there, of course, uh, there's a lot of talk about employability, employability skills and competencies and the like. And Gil, you mentioned that your entire program is uh, extracurricular. Do you see any overlap or do you have any connections to anything being done in the Ville area at your university? That's an excellent question. Thank you. And it's actually a nice segue into the next part of, of the presentation. So we can move forward with that. So yes, there are definitely overlaps with work integrated learning. Um, we've actually just developed an, a new version or a modified version of the PLUS program, which is going to be called Work Ready PLUS. So I'll adapt several of the workshops that I've already developed and that I've been running for some years with students to specifically target and um, develop their awareness of of um, professional practice in the workplace. So what they need to do to prepare for their placement, what they'll need to do to get, get the most out of their, um, their placement. So how to reflect, um, how to confidently ask questions if they don't know answers to things, um, how to work within a, you know, a team in the workplace, how to record their experiences so that they can really learn from them. So we're actually um, integrating it in that way. So I sort of see there's, there's two parts here. One is the placement itself, but the other is the professional skills and the professional, um, the career development awareness that you need to have in order to really um, capitalise on the workplace experience. You know, it's all very well and good to go out and, and, and do a job in a workplace, but unless you really reflect on what was challenging, what worked, what didn't work, why did it happen that way, or, you know, what could I have done differently? They don't get the full value of the experience. Um, but the other part of what we do is actually the embedded models. So um, we'll move to a little bit of a, um, a showcase of what we do in that space. So this was another opportunity we had some years ago within the Bachelor of Engineering. There was a push from, um, from the top, driven by the head of school and the deputy head of school learning and teaching in um, conjunction with the employability champion, let's say, who sits within that school, um, to embed a professional practice and employability stream. So this is actually um, a series of tasks that students do from first year to final year within the Bachelor of Engineering um, to develop their employability skills. So it's a diverse range of things. It covers um, researching the skills to be successful, ethics in engineering, um, you know, hearing from industry uh, representatives, reflecting on what they've learned, preparing their career toolkit, so their co um, cover letter, their CV, their LinkedIn profile. Um, in final year, they conduct an informational interview where they actually go out and, and talk with somebody from industry. So it's a whole range of different skills. You can see on the um, on the right of the screen there that the way this works in engineering is it's embedded in specific courses all the way through the program. So because it's an accredited program and it's a fairly linear progress for students, um, in this you know in the in the third year there there are we have to be a bit creative and and a, the same task will sit in six different courses. But by doing it this way, we know that every single student who's progressing through the Bachelor of Engineering. Um, is going to complete all of these tasks. Uh, every now and again, we get some overlap and we have a couple of alternatives that we can have students do. Um, but it's a, a way that we've been able to embed the development of the student skills, which, um, you know, for us in Australia, there's been a, a real focus recently on widening participation. So creating opportunities for students who might not usually be able to come to university to come and study with us. And we recognise that those students don't necessarily have the time to be able to engage with those extracurricular activities. So embedding in this way actually means that we, we create more of an equitable opportunity for all students to spend time on this important career development activity. Um, so importantly, in this model, it's a very highly structured um, degree program. As they progress through, some of um, the tasks are very specifically aligned to the engineering stage one competencies. So we move from the general career development activity to the very specific activity that um, where students create their awareness and, and develop their knowledge about what employers of, of engineering graduates are looking for. And we encourage them to evidence their skills and experiences against those stage one competencies. 
that's fully embedded all the way through to the, the final year, which is effectively an honours year. Um, it has links back to Engineering Plus. So students now who are doing this work within the embedded stream, they can also do a couple of extra things and they can get their Engineering Plus badge. And in their final year, they can also earn, or they're required to earn actually, um, a professional practice badge in engineering. So this reflects the work they do uh, engaging with the industry in various ways, including a final year placement, which is the industry in industrial affiliates program, um, and the informational interview and, and reflecting and evidencing their skills. So it's a, fair, it's, a, it's a very robust program where students are really scaffolding and developing their knowledge across all um, four years of the program. We uh, had um, someone ask, uh, Gail, how many students participate in the program? Is it like a cohort model? Okay, thanks, Chris. I can't actually see the chat because I'm sharing my screen. Of you guys over there on the other small screen and so I can't see the chat. So if there is chat, I appreciate that you're letting me know. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a cohort model. So um, I assume you're talking there about the engineering model, the embedded one. Um, there's usually about 250 students commencing in the Bachelor of Engineering each year. We do have some students who come in in the second year, so they might miss a couple of those tasks. Um, but they are all standalone. So even if they if they didn't pick up a couple in first year, they can continue on with the stream, the employability stream when they commence in second year. Um, in terms of plus, uh, they can start any time. And I have got, you know, different groups of people who are completing bronze, silver and gold at different times. So it can get a little bit unwieldy to manage that. Um, but that's actually where Pebble Pad comes in. And, and I've been able to use Pebble pad in a way that I can very quickly track and see which students have completed activity in terms of recording their reflections after the workshops or, you know, sending me through their resume or their cover letter for review and those kinds of things. So Pebble pad has actually um, created uh, opportunity for us to really develop our, um, our approach to employability based learning across the sciences group. Uh, in a way that we wouldn't have been able to do if we didn't have access to Pebble Pad. So that's that's created another opportunity for us. Um, and one of the things particularly uh, was to, one, once we had that model established in engineering and we had some evidence that it was working in engineering and students were engaging well with the tasks, um, we were able to then draw from that to develop a similar and yet fundamentally different approach in the Bachelor of Science. So similar in the sense that we, we reflect some of the same kinds of activities, different in the sense that we really only have the first year of the science degree to play with. Um, after first year, there are so many different majors for students, so much, so much flexibility for them in how they progress from, from the end of um, first year onto their final year. So trying to embed from first year to final year in the way we did in engineering would not have been possible. So we instead have developed a model where we embed in that first foundation year in trimester one and trimester two. Um, and there is some difference in the tasks here because part of what we're wanting students to understand in science is, um, the difference is there, um, is how to manage and the transferability of their scientific skills and knowledge in an industry where they might not be working in what could be called a traditional science role. So it's really important that students understand how their skills will actually enable their success in lots of different ways in, in lots of different contexts. So that's a focus for these employability tasks. Um, we do relate back to the science threshold learning outcomes. So we always have that, um, that discipline focus fully embedded in the first year. And the activities are again linked to PLUS, but here you can see the diversity. So in engineering, it was linked to engineering. In the Bachelor of Science um, and the way we've embedded this in first year, it actually links to Environment Plus, Forensics Plus and Science Plus. We recognise that we've got students coming in from all different disciplines and potentially moving out into lots of different, um, in lots of different careers. We do also have students from other disciplines, so particularly from education, students who are studying um, science education are also involved. And we have enough flexibility in the courses that we can acknowledge 
um, that, you know, they might not evidence against the science threshold learning outcomes. They might evidence against competency frameworks that are relevant for their particular discipline. So I think one of the keys for embedding employability is to recognise that we do have students coming from, um, from lots of different areas of study. And we also have students who might be fresh out of school, 17 and 18 year olds, and we might have students who are mature age who are coming back to, you know, study in a different area and, and you know, recreate their careers. So all of the tasks we develop bear that in mind. And that's where I, I'd like to be able to say that we, we are customising for each student, that flexibility is there to allow them to actually do the parts of the work that are most relevant and important for them. Really hard to see which slide I'm up to with these little icons on the slide. Is that the first one? Thank you. Right now you're on the how to architect slide 24. Um, just a quick question since you right now mentioned that you have um, a large age group of people in, in the classes and therefore personalize the portfolio experience for them. Um, how do you go about that? Do you ask them before they come to the first session? Do, is there a survey so that you can already start tailoring that before they come or is that happening uh, during, the trimester, during the first trimester? Yeah, it really happens during the trimester. Um, and it's, a, it's, it's embedded in the flexibility of the task. So, for example, I've just developed a task for first year science and previously all students had to do the same thing. And I ran it a couple of times and I realised that for some students it, it's just not very relevant to them that, or they don't understand the relevance because they are mature age and they have had, you know, significant experience already in the workplace. So those students now can choose, you know, there's part A and part B and now they can choose option one or option two within part A. So it gets a little bit, you know, you've got to give lots of information to students. So it's really clear to them what they're expected to do. Um, but it gives them that choice they need to say, oh, I don't really need to, to write a cover letter. I'm really pretty confident about my cover letter, but I don't know much yet about LinkedIn. So I'll do the LinkedIn task. Um, and I do say that with the caveat, I, I actually introduced that task to the first year students in a lecture on uh, Monday afternoon. And I do say it with the caveat that sometimes you don't know what you don't know. So students might think they've got a really good cover letter, um, but they, they don't necessarily, they might not necessarily be aware of some particular things they could do to actually make it even better, you know, really enhance it. Um, in terms of plus, the, um, the, the individualization comes from the reflection. So when I read these reflections, and I can show you a sample of, of you know, the length of, of the response that students provide in each reflection after every workshop, and I read all of those reflections, or I try to, um, and I can see that students who attended the exact same workshop will pick out completely different things and will say, oh, I've never thought about this before, and it was so eye-opening when, when we discussed such and such. And a different student will, will just comment on something completely different. And then they, they, they tell me why. So within the reflection, they'll say, this was important because, you know, or I hadn't thought about it and this would have been useful when. So they're really contextualising it to their own experiences. Um, so I think that's one of the ways that, it, it, you know, we're able to customise because there's such a large focus on that reflective practice. Um, and in all of the embedded tasks, it, there's lots. I mean, I, I have a pebble pad worksheet developed called How to Write Reflectively, and I think it sits in just about every workbook I develop. So, um, you know, that emphasis on that reflective practice is, is really strong. Great, thank you very much, Keel. Over to you, Dave. Okay, um, I just wanted to, yeah, we were talking before about the extracurriculum um, activities that um, the Gail does with PLUS, but then we've got at the other end, um, something like our architecture program. Uh, we, we provide an undergraduate program and a, and a postgrad and a master's. And um, the master's is a professional, uh, the professional component of it. Um, so in Australia, to register as an architect, uh, you need to be able to um, evidence your, your ability or your, your evidence your dem or demonstrate that you meet all the national standards for competencies for architects. Now, they, this, 
was created by a body called the Architect Accreditation Council of Australia, and they review architecture programs every five years to make sure that they're up to date. Um, it was decided, um, it, it basically covers about 70 performance criteria um, across design, documentation, uh, project delivery and practice management. Um, so we decided as a university that we were going to really embed this framework into our studio courses so that we knew that once the students actually did their, had completed their studio courses, you know, they'd be, they'd be compliant. So could you jump to the next one, please, Gail? Uh -huh. Sure. Um, yeah, so, so the one I'm going to have a quick chat about today is um, the first, first studio. Now, this is a, it's a 20 credit point course, so it's, it's one of the larger courses for the students. And previously, it, it, it's always been a, a very practice-led um, studio. They've done, you know, gone through the process of um, planning based on a client's requirements and presenting some sort of project at the end of that. Um, we decided to use uh, Pebblepad, um, the workbook, as a, as a platform for the students to then, then actually um, collate all the information, um, demonstrate their, their, um, their evidence, and, and to provide sort of justification of the things that they did. So um, this, was, this was decided that we were going to focus primarily on the first two categories of the uh, standards, which was the design and the documentation. And we'll, it was going to be set up exactly as, a, as they would be doing as an architect once, the, once they graduate. Um, it's a completely, the, the assessment project went for the entire trimester and um, it also aligned exactly with the criteria. And just to show you what we mean by that, if you go to the next one, please, Gail. Uh, you can see here, with, we, we chose the Purple Pad workbook primarily because it allowed the students to have, you know, a, a common online space to collect all their, their um, evidence, but it also allowed the teaching team to be monitoring it um, real time so they could see where the students were up to. Because the way this works is the students are given a, a client brief, they have to go through the process of uh, responding to that brief, um, documenting what they did about that and, and going right through to the, to the end where they present um, a response to the, to the clients. Now, on the left, we've got just a quick screen capture of the um, workbook and you'll... Actually, I'll start on the other side. On the right, the competency criteria. You'll see there, this is just a, a little short uh, clip of, of the, the, whole, the whole thing. You'll see there that... Um, there's 11 different, there's 11 different categories um, and you'll see each performance criteria has a specific number, you know, you've got the 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 1 and that indicates, and that is then reflected in the uh, Pebble Pad workbook, you'll see across on the left, we actually have a page for each one of those performance criteria. So it's then the role of the student as they're going through their project and responding to the client requirements, um, they are going through and actually responding to each of the, each of the criteria. Um, the students are asked to choose an item or, or a piece of evidence uh, and then embed that into their workbook. They're also asked to justify why they chose that piece of evidence and how that relates to the performance criteria. Um, the, the academic team or the teaching team then provide feedback on that and they actually mark it. If they don't meet the requirements, uh, the students are provided with an opportunity to then contribute or to go back, have a look at it, um, look at the feedback from the teaching team, um, choose another piece of evidence and then reflect on what they think they did wrong in the first place and why they think this new piece of evidence is, um, is appropriate. And it just gives them that, it just gives them that opportunity to, to, you know, to get there in the end. Because you know, if you just um, if you just mark it straight off, it's, it's going to cause problems later on for the students. So, you know, it's like real life. You often don't get a one-off chance to get something right. You're normally given a bit of an opportunity to um, to work on it. 
Um, yeah, so you can see there that not every performance criteria was um, in, oh, go, go back, go back, please, Charles. You'll see there in, in the student workbook, there's only 1.2, 1.4 and 1.7. Um, and that's because some of the performance criteria weren't relevant to that assessment piece and they would be found somewhere else in the student's program in one of the other courses. Okay, so you can jump forward now, please. Yeah, so this is basically the, the, the learning design for the students. You'll see there we've broken it sort of up into what the students do and what the academic team does. Uh, this is something that we use just when we're putting together our purple pad um, resources. So you can see there, yeah, the students, as they're working through their project, they're working in the studio and they basically live in these studios with their teaching team. Um, and just going through the process of basically acting like an architect. Um, which they'll be a year after they do this program. And uh, it gives them the opportunity to you know, identify the activities that they, they think demonstrate their knowledge and their skills and the application of those skills. And it gives the academic team uh, the option to look and, and monitor the students to make sure that they're on, they're on track as they go. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's sort of the general idea there that by the end of the trimester, these students as they're doing their work, they're just constantly referring back to the uh, performance criteria. So it, it provides them with an opportunity to realize why they're doing activities. Because you know, often students go, why am I doing this? I can't see the relevance of it. But this shows them the exact relevance that if they don't do this, they won't be able to register as, as a, um, an architect at the end of their program. Um, I didn't have a look, is there any, are there any questions related to that one? I think Chris is going to talk a little bit more about some of these learning designs, but um, yeah, so across the yep, yeah. okay. So what I was going to talk about next. Uh, my name's Chris Allen. I said uh, I've uh, also been involved in a lot of developing of uh, elements that are related to the uh, to this uh, section of Plus and uh, employability. One of the things that uh, we needed to develop was an idea for a way to dis uh, describe and display the, the types of activities that um, the teachers wanted to, to uh, incorporate that would make it clear and easy for them to, to know what they're trying to do, for us to be able to help them build the materials, and also for us to be able to, to use them again. So to come up with uh, new ideas and, and new strategies that um, already uh, incorporate some of the ideas that we've been we've, we've developed before, and as is written in this slide, the, the, one of the biggest points of it is to try to make the purpose clear, to try and align everything, and to make it easier for other people to to use these designs uh, later and to be able to uh, incorporate they, these into their own courses. Should I go to the next slide, Gail? Thank you. So this is another program that we've got in place. This is the Graduate Diploma of Physiology. Uh, it also has employability aspects. It has a, a series of courses that uh, end up in a clinical placement. And uh, they basically collect ideas about um, what they uh, think about the, the, the workplace they're going to go into. They build a, a resume. Uh, that's relevant to them. They reflect upon their experiences in the workplace and then they have to complete finally a, a portfolio at the end. And so, and they collect a, a log of all of the activities that occur in their placement itself, case studies, and also a supervisor report. And so we had to try and come up with a way to connect all of these things, but we also wanted to work out a way that would allow multiple courses uh, or units or programs, depending on how your university describes them, um, that uh, would be able to be connected together in order to put together a portfolio at the end of it all. And so, as you can see in this particular diagram, there are some of the courses that are involved and some of the, uh, the activities that are incorporated into this. Uh, are the portfolios shared with their employers? Uh, yes, I believe that some of these portfolios can be shared with the employers. The, the thing about um, all of these portfolios is that 
they are the student's own work. And so even though there are uh, activities that are developed within the courses and that, that are marked and assessed within the courses, they are also able to be shown to other people outside. So if the student wants to show information that they've done in their portfolio or elements of that, then yes, they can present that to their, um, to their employers. Not all of the activities and such that are created in there would necessarily be put in the final portfolio. Uh, in that way, they don't necessarily have to um, show all of the supervisor feedback and such within that. Yeah, so we really make a distinction there between the learning portfolio and the, and the, let's say, the showcase portfolio. So they might keep this portfolio of all of their experiences and then they can draw from those to, to put into the showcase portfolio. They're certainly encouraged, I think, to share um, with employers and we also encourage them to link from their LinkedIn profile back to their portfolio and in their email signature block to put those kinds of links as well so that when they're um, communicating with uh, industry professionals, it's not necessarily, here's my portfolio, but it gives an opportunity for the, to the industry professional to say, oh, I could, have a, I could have a look at that. So, you know, it becomes the intrinsic thing that they might do. That's correct. Can you go take the next slide? Yep. So, again, we were talking, we showed it earlier with David, and, and, and here I've got another example. This is just uh, one of the many tasks that are in this particular program. And so one of the courses has a professional statement task. And so what we've tried to do is we've tried to create a design, uh, a very simple design here that would allow the, the academic to know who's doing what in the task. And so in this particular instance, there are uh, instructions are being provided on our, uh, our Blackboard site, so our learning management system. And then from that, the students are going into a portfolio, creating a professional statement, and then submitting it for feedback from the, uh, the academic. And so this is just a simple task, but it just gives us an idea. The, the, the design here just gives a very easy way for the academic to understand what's being created, what tools are being used, because obviously, uh, Gail has developed lots and lots and lots and lots of tasks, and uh, we want to make sure that it's easy for an academic to embed that within their courses. And so this particular kind of instruction here that shows the process allows that to happen. Uh, if we look at the next one, again, a similar kind of thing. It's just a personal reflective writing task, same sort of thing. Instructions on how to complete it are put into the site and then uh, provided up uh, back by back into portfolio, which is then submitted for uh, feedback as well. The resume builder, another one, similar kind of activity, but this one is, there's a, we have a workbook that has a whole lot of strategies relating to how to build an effective resume. Those things are available to the student to have a look at as a resource. They then can uh, save a copy of that, and then they can start building their own resume based on the worksheets that are provided. During the time that they're in the class, feedback is provided by uh, other students or in this particular case, academic team. They can then create a resume based on that uh, feedback and they can make that available in their final portfolio. So there's, there's diff all these different tasks that are available. Here is the reflective template uh, for work integrated learning. I remember somebody was asking about work integrated learning. So obviously in this particular course, they have their clinical placements. And so whilst in their clinical placements, or I should say, before they go to the clinical placement, they have a couple of activities they, they need to do. So they do a before placement reflective activity. When they go into the placement, which you can see in the middle of this diagram, they complete a during placement reflective activity. The workplace provides, uh, they have professional the placement itself, so they have to go to the workplace. The supervisor provides some feedback and things like that. The academic views the workbooks that they're doing. So the good thing about the way these are set up, as they're creating stuff, as they're adding things into it, the, uh, the academic can actually see it. And so they can see what they're adding in as they go. And they can be providing feedback and sending reminder emails if the student hasn't put any information in relating to their placement as they go along, which can be really helpful to them. After the placement, they do a bit of reflection again. They write a summary. They get some feedback from that and, and some marks from the academic, and then they review those marks and feedback so that they've got some information about how they did in their placement. So these designs, and then here's the final one. So at the end of all of these uh, courses, they create an e-portfolio. Uh, they 
modify that professional statement they did in the early course. They add some of the case studies they gained in their professional placement. They provide the log tally of the hours that they had completed in certain activities in their clinical placement. And they provide other documents that they think might be relevant to the portfolio, which are generated in previous courses. They grab their will workbook. So the work integrated work, uh, learning workbook that they, I showed the previous task. And then they put it all together, present all those ideas in a way that they think represents the, what they've learnt in uh, their placement and in all of the activities they've done. And they submit that for feedback and grading as well. So I guess before we we'll move to the Padlet and hopefully open up for a little bit of, of conversation, you may have noticed on, a, on some earlier slides, I had a quote there from one of our colleagues, um, the billion dollar quote, embedded and assessed is not the only way. And I don't know whether that's the right number of zeros for a billion or not. <laughs> it might be a trillion. Um, uh, the quote previously was that embedded and assessed is the only way. And while we definitely acknowledge and are obviously working very um comprehensively in this space of embedding these tasks. We do also recognise that it's not the only way. It's not always possible um, with certain degree structures or with certain um, limitations within an institution in terms of resourcing or staff availability or, um, you know, content-heavy courses. And we've had those conversations many times with our academic colleagues about how to adjust content in certain courses to allow for some of this um, professional development activity to take place. So we sort of thought it's a little bit of a scale moving from not embedded and, and, and more generic through to fully embedded and, and fully discipline specific. And you can sort of see the way we've mapped these four models that we've shown today. Although I realize now that we don't have the graduate diploma of clinical physiology on there that Chris was just demonstrating. And that one really showcases that, that program-wide approach that we do have in all of them. Um, but, you know, it's been a very, structured in a very particular way. Um, I also just want to acknowledge as we went through the slides, you may have seen we had some acknowledgements to our, our academic colleagues um, in, in all of the schools. And that's another really important part of why um, these models have been successful. So it's this... Um, combination of, of us with our expertise in the learning and teaching space or in the employability space, working with academic staff who are experts in their particular discipline area. So none of these strategies or none of these models that we've shown you are bolt on. They are actually integrated into um, the discipline and they're contextualized for the disciplines. And that actually includes Sciences Plus because throughout that program, students are encouraged to think about the skills that are important in their discipline and to do that research and to talk with those industry people. So it is actually um, connected to the discipline in that way. Um, so, Chris, if I share the, the Padlet and then we can um, figure out how to do that. There it is. Look at that. Two of you. So I, I, I guess over to you. What, what are your thoughts um, I think on this Padlet, if you've opened it up yourself, you can click on all of these things. You can see some examples of the kinds of activities um, that uh, what this actually looks like in PebblePad on this side and some of those support resources that we provide as well. So marking rubrics. This one I'll just quickly show you if it opens. Um, that's actually a marking rubric within PebblePad and that's a snapshot I took of a student's workbook. So that blue tick all the way down in the excellent column, that was the student actually doing a self-evaluation of their work using that interactive rubric. Um, and the way the rubrics are written is to provide advice to students about how to move from, you know, satisfactory to good and from good to outstanding. So that's actually built into the rubric and students can use that in this interactive way uh, in PebblePad. So this is an yeah. opportunity for people people to ask some questions or, or give us some ideas of what they think might work or might not work or what they what they're doing in their own areas. Gail, if somebody wanted to get started with something like this, what would be your top three tips be? <laughs> uh, for an embedded model? Um, for the, let's, let's do the science plus one, the extracurricular one. Yep. Uh, okay, so for the extracurricular one, and, and that's an interesting question, actually, because I developed the first iteration of PLUS seven years ago, and Dave and Chris can tell you that it looked very, very different to how it looks now. 
Um, so that it's, it's a difficult question for me in some ways because I've brought plus with help. This has not just been me by any means. This has been a collaborative process and, and we've done lots of talking and sharing ideas in the office about how best to make it work because it can be quite um, unwieldy. Um, but, and we brought it to the point it is now. So I would say have clear expectations for students, really outline exactly what they need to do to get to each level um, Put, build in those milestone points. So it's a fairly broad set of activities that students need to complete and leaving it until the very end to offer them reward for what the work they've done doesn't work. Um, and in one of the earlier models of PLUS, that's probably what went wrong. Um, they had to, you know, they had to go all the way through and create a portfolio before they got any recognition. Whereas now they come to three workshops, they write three reflections, they get a certificate. They come to four more workshops, they write four more reflections, they get another certificate. Um, and they also get pineapple pens, by the way, which sounds ridiculous, but is a real motivator for students. I've just actually mailed a couple of pineapple pens over to Norway for a student who had completed his plus and hadn't got his pens yet. And he's like, I really want those pens. Um, so it's a bizarre thing, but it, it, it's actually a motivator for students. Pineapples are a... Um, historically a status symbol and a symbol of success. So that's why we chose the pineapple. Um, so I guess the, the three tips, um, be really clear on, on what you want the students to do and make it really clear to students. Build in milestone celebration points for the students so that they don't feel that they're doing a lot of work um, that for, for no or little reward. And contextualise it to their discipline. So help them understand what skills and capabilities are important in their industry and have whatever the output is relevant to their industry because then they can really see the way um, the activity connects with their future career. And that honestly is where PLUS came from in the first place. I was in a retention role. How do we keep students in first year? I thought because we let them know everything they're doing at uni is relevant for their future. And that's actually where it came from initially. I think, too, one of the things that, that Gail was mentioning there, and I think is quite important about uh, doing these kind of things, expect it to take time. And I think that's the thing that she was saying at the beginning there. What, what you come up with in the first instance is not necessarily going to be the, the best way to do it. doesn't matter. Keep building upon it. Keep working out different ideas. Keep trying different things. And as the first year goes by and you realise what didn't quite work or what did work, just keep pers persisting with it. Because that's been one of the most impressive things about what I've seen with Gail's work in this is that just keep changing, keep thinking about things. And the other thing that's pretty important is, is the collaborations. So the, the finding people who can help. Um, I know that what we've done in, this, in these instances before is, is spoken to a lot of different people about different ways of, about going about these tasks. Uh, when we first uh, decided to use the portfolio system Pebble Pad, we ended up actually going over to the UK and speaking to a lot of different academics and a lot of different programs to figure out what would be the best way to make some of these things work. And um, the information we learned from that basically changed the whole structure of what we were suggesting or what we were thinking about doing. Uh, and we went with a completely different model and that model worked a lot better than what we were originally thinking about. So talking to people who are, who are trying different things and, and having conversations and, and, and sharing ideas has been one of the things that's been very valuable for, for us. And we're very happy, I think, I'm speaking for Gail as well here, where we're sharing the ideas back and forward because we got so much from that in the first instance. Question is, has the program helped with retention? I, I couldn't say categorically yes and back it up with evidence. Um, anecdotally, I would say yes, because the students who are in PLUS, um, and, and I say when I say that PLUS in that context means embedded activity, or the extracurricular. So all of that falls under the plus umbrella. And I would suggest that, that yes, it has helped with retention because students are much clearer about why they're doing what they're doing at university. Um, in various roles I've worked in in the past at Griffith, 
that was that was one of the big things I found. We'd have, we'd have students coming into first year, we'd have them do these core courses, and sometimes they didn't understand why they were doing them. And so they they would think, oh, what's this about? You know, I signed up to do in a business context, I signed up to do marketing. Why am I studying, you know, government or whatever? And so explaining to students the way all of these things connect together and that they're developing not only the, the specific knowledge but also the transferability, transferable skills, learning how to learn, um, and that's a really big one that, that I emphasise for students a lot. We can't teach them everything there is to know about, you know, marine biology, let's say, in three years but we can give them some foundation knowledge and we can give them some skills so that they can keep developing their knowledge as they progress through their career. Um, so making those, making that explicit, I think is really important. And, you know, I've read informational interviews from final year students where they've said, oh, I went and met with, you know, Mark from GHD and he told me that it's really important I have teamwork and communication skills, you know, the skills I don't learn at university. Um, and, of course, we know that students are learning those skills. They're embedded in all of the courses. They're embedded in all of the ways we're asking them to complete their assessments. But unless we actually say to them, hey, guys, did you know you learned oral communication skills when you did that presentation? Or did you know you learned teamwork skills when you had to work as a group to do that assignment? Unless we tell them, they miss it. So it's, it's about making those things overt and then they can connect what they're hearing from industry or what they're learning from their own research about what skills they need to what they're doing at uni. And then they go, oh, yeah, I do have evidence for that. I can provide evidence of my critical thinking or my problem solving or whatever it might be. For the extracurricular plus, how do students learn about the program or join? About the program or... Uh, I think I assume that means how to join the program. How do they find out about... Oh, the right, Okay. Yep, so um, there, there is actually an opportunity for them to express interest in PLUS through their orientation process. So as they go through all of the early orientation activities, they get a chance to, to register their interests. Once we have them registered, they'll then get an email from me that welcomes them to the program, and then they get another email as we get close to the start of a series of workshops to join and register for the workshop. So they sort of do a couple of register their interest and then register for a workshop. Um, lots of them, you know, lots, lots join the workshop and continue right through. Some I find will come to a few workshops and then they drop off. So that's sort of natural attrition that you can expect. Um, there is a website and I think I saw in the chat there that somebody, Chris, maybe put the link to the website. Um, we also do some promotion in class through academics and with that work ready plus that I mentioned earlier this kind of new version um, that will ultimately become a requirement for any student who wants to do a placement um, that will be promoted through the, the work integrated learning office through our program service offices and, and organization sites where all students from a particular discipline area are so we've got a, a, a few different ways I actually think now um, that, that it's going to be a lot of word of mouth. The students who have completed bronze, silver and gold and I've, we're running a celebration event next week so I've got lots and lots of students right now going, here's my portfolio, here's my portfolio because they all want to get their gold pen next week. Um, so I think as more and more students come through, it will be word of mouth um, because, because the students are talking about it and, and they're, um, they're keen to bring their peers in to have this experience as well. It's amazing how much pineapple pens can help um, get students, uh, um, make students <laughs> do their portfolios. Yeah. And it, look, it's one of the nicest things about the presentation event because I actually do give them the reason um, why we award a pineapple pen. So it's not just an arbitrary thing. There's actually a purpose behind it. And, it, and it's really nice to explain that to students and they kind of light up when they hear about what the pineapple actually represents. <laughs> Although Do you I, mind sharing when that when with, told, uh, with um, us as well? When I first, sorry, when I first told uh, Dean Mel and T, who, who we, you know, we work for, that I wanted to order, you know, 500 pineapple pens, <laughs> I think she nearly fell off the chair. So sorry, I missed your question there. Uh, sorry, good. Uh, do you mind sharing the, uh, briefly the meaning behind the, the pineapple oh, pens? Oh, sure. <laughs> so way back in the day, um, 
it was very it was very difficult to transport pineapples from where they were grown um, to say you know countries in Europe because the transport was so slow. By the time the pineapples would arrive, they would actually be deteriorated beyond the point of being edible, and so they they couldn't do much with them. And so it came um, that if you had a pineapple. It, it was a, um, an indication of your success. If you could actually afford to buy a pineapple, which was about the equivalent of $8,000, our money, um, in around the 1500s. So if you could afford to buy a pineapple, that actually demonstrated that you were successful. And you would find that people would actually rent pineapples to carry around with them at parties to show their success. Um, they would rent a pineapple to, to put in on display at a party to show their guests how successful they were. Um, and you'll see this representation of pineapples all, all, the, all the time in, you know, the design of furniture, in paintings. Um, King Charles I actually commissioned a painting of his gardener presenting him with the pineapple. Um, so it's quite a status symbol and, and an indication that you've made it. So that's where it comes from. <laughs> that's a good, a good story, yeah. So we still have a couple of minutes until the hour, one minute now, until the top of the hour. Um, Everybody is welcome to ask more questions of our very knowledgeable team here from Griffiths University, Gail, David, and uh, Chris. If you have to leave, uh, please do check out the links that I posted earlier around the evaluation form for the session and also the schedule for tomorrow, because today this is the last session. And of course, we'd also like to hear if you have any fabulous ideas for implementing portfolios because you still have time to submit your Shark Tank proposal until the end of tonight. So please make sure so that you can also win a prize on the last day of the conference. I'll have to check with Helen and Tracy if there are any pineapples there, but uh, might be a bit more Shark Tank related, unless there's a pine pineapple falling into the water. Not sure if that works in Queensland um, or in other parts of the world. But now back to uh, Gail and the team. Um, I might just add one other thing, which I, I forgot to mention before as well. Um, a lot of the teaching team find, going back to the architecture one, a lot of the teaching team found it really useful as well that when they were developing or when they were talking to students or developing activities, being able to have a framework to make sure they're not, you know, because time is time is very valuable, and uh, make sure they're not sort of going off on a tangent for things that aren't um, aren't relevant. Um, you know, as as Gail's mentioning, the the architecture one is a very linear one. You don't do the Masters of Architects unless you're going to register to be an architect, pretty much. So, um, so everything is very focused on on meeting those criteria. So, but yeah, so it's just as useful for the um, teaching teams as it is for the students, I think. Maybe just a, a completely different question, not not content related, but reward related. What rewards are other universities uh, giving out to their students, and do they work as well as the pineapple ones? <laughs> The other thing the students do get, so the, the pineapples are nice, they also get the certificates. Um, at gold level, they get a framed certificate with a, with a gold seal. But the, the real rewards are that they can submit their resume for review, they submit their LinkedIn profile for review, and I provide substantial impact um, feedback on those things. They provide their cover letter for review, and then, of course, their portfolio. And all along there's opportunity for, for students to make changes and send it back, make changes and send it back. So by the time they get to the end of the program, they have a really strong toolkit ready um, to help them, uh, you know, apply for opportunities. And one thing that I say to students all the time, I, I talk about the job search, and I always say that doesn't start in final trimester or final year. Your creative job search starts in your first year because it involves all the things you do forming connections, going to seminars, getting volunteer experiences, getting leadership experiences, connecting with your peers through student clubs and those kinds of things. All of that is part of the job search strategy. And so when I have students who come into PLUS in the first 
trimester or their first year, I think they're really setting themselves up for success because they get all of these ideas that they can then activate as they progress through their career. So leaving it to final trimester is, is too late. Um, and that's a message that I really try to get out to students in both the embedded and the co-curricular side of the class. So in the chat, we have a couple of um, other options of what rewards could look like. So one is um, even before there's a reward that stickers are handed out during orientation that students love. And another program uses graduation medallions and digital badges as rewards. So uh, Kali or Claire, if you want to share anything using your microphone, please go ahead. Yeah, we just started giving out stickers. We were just trying to think of a way to get students to come to like, I don't know if y'all do a lot of tabling, but we do a lot of tabling. And so we wanted to bring them to our table. So they've stopped by and they're just like stickers. They can stick on their um, drink cups or their laptops and they've just been really popular. So. Yeah, we use um, graduation medallions, which are like a, a medal and it's, they're really big at our university. Like um, they, where I went to school, we didn't have them, but when I started working at, um, I'm at the University of Florida now, um, everyone loves like as many graduation medallions as you can get. So it's a nice reward. The digital badge is new and students really don't know what to do with it yet. So they're kind of just like, thanks for, like, this is great. Um, but like I said in the chat, our problem is they're all at the very end. And I think we could do, I, I actually really am excited about this pins idea and really cannot wait to pitch it to my boss. And like, I think this could be it. Like, I'm really pumped about this. If you send me your email, I've, I've actually got the status of pineapples written up because when we couldn't do the on in-person celebrations, I had to mail things out to students and I didn't want to miss them to miss out on why the pen pineapple is so important. So if you send me your email, I'm happy to email that through. That might help with your pitching. <laughs> I, yes, I will be happy to connect. <laughs> Great. If that's not the case, I'd very much like to thank uh, Gail, Chris, and also David from Crifts University in Queensland in Australia for their wonderful presentation on the extracurricular as well as also embedded portfolio options. And then also the conversation that resulted from it, as well as giving us a fantastic idea of um, stockpiling um, new products that we can give to students in order to motivate them even a little bit more to participate in portfolio activities. So thank you very much, everybody. And um, if you like, you can continue working in the room here. I'm just going to stop the recording. Thank you, everyone. Nice to have met all of you. Mm -hmm.